via email. And now to hear more about this exciting project, I will turn the floor over to um, Dr. Trent Alexander and Dr. Katie Genedek and David Blackley. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm Trent Alexander and I'm the Associate Director of ICPSR. And I'm presenting this with Katie Genetic, who is an economist um, at the US Census Bureau and David Bleckley, who's a project manager at ICPSR. And um, we love talking about this and we'll go on and on. So I, we will, we're gonna be, try to be very disciplined and leave time for questions at the end. Um, what we're talking about, just to give you the big picture kind of quickly, is creating an infrastructure of linked census data linked at the person level from 1850 through the present. Um, this components of this are already available. We've been working on this in different ways for a very long time. And I do believe the end is in sight. So we're gonna tell you um, about how we're doing this and um, how you can access the data. So what we're, well, I'm gonna start by giving a little bit of background on how we got into this. Uh, Katie and I have been working on this for a very long time. And uh, since I came to ICPSR three years ago, David Bleckley, uh, we're very pleased that he has joined the team. We're each gonna um, present a little part of this talk. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about longitudinal infrastructure in the United States, because a lot of the data I'm gonna describe is already available. Um, how the record linkage that we have done has taken place and that we will do is taking place at the Census Bureau. Katie is gonna describe two projects that we've undertaken to expand this linked infrastructure already. And then David is gonna talk about um, how you can get the data and our plans for completing the infrastructure within the next few years. So this is where I started um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in the 1990s. I was working with uh, public use census microdata um, that I got on reel-to-reel -reel tape uh, that's how we all got census microdata from about the 1960s through the 1990s. Um, and it was hard to use, for sure. Um, the, each file had its own layout. Variables, even if it was the same variable from census to census, were coded differently. Uh, space was a huge issue. I remember how hard I had to fight to get a five gigabyte partition um, on the Carnegie Mellon mainframe in the mid nineties and how happy I was when I got it and I shared it with friends and kept it for as long as I could. Um, so it was hard, but it was actually great. Um, that was my introduction into um, making data easier to use. And I'm a demographic historian, but I will say I, I did feel like I had sort of two dissertations at Carnegie Mellon. One was on uh, migration within the US. The other was just making the census data easier to use. Uh, it was hard and I loved it. Uh, what I did realize towards the end of my time there is that there was a group of people who were doing a much better job of it um, at the Minnesota Population Center. Uh, the IPOMS project, if you haven't heard of it, it's at IPOMS.org. They, uh, really beginning in the mid-1990s, integrate census microdata. Um, so harmonize those codes over time. Um, harmonize the variable names over time and add value uh, in many ways and make it so you can download extracts of the data rather than the entire data set because these can get quite large. Um, so I, I uh, went to work there after I got my PhD and uh, I was there for 10 years, as was Katie. So she and I both definitely cut our teeth in this game at the University of Minnesota and I think learned a lot of the lessons and got kind of some of the, the, the passion that we have now for this project there. Uh, this model of integrating microdata files and making them uh, much easier to access and use has uh, really been extended to a lot of different domains. Uh, so you can see the different products that are available right now. IPUMS USA is the census data that um, um, both Katie and I began working on, but this has really been gone to lots of different, uh, it, it's been a great model for providing other types of data. Uh, the one I wanna talk about for just a minute, because it really did motivate, what you're gonna hear is that there's a real data rescue component of this project. Um, that was largely motivated by IPUMS International. Um, and let me just show you a couple of sort of images to let you know where I'm coming from there. Uh, they were traveling and they still are traveling around the world since the early 2000s, um, 
gathering census microdata from really countries all around the world from about 1960 to the present, in many cases uh, recovering and restoring data that was in great danger of being lost um, and providing it back to the, uh, the country that providing the data and then providing it to researchers around the world in an anonymized and really well-documented format. Um, this is, I believe, uh, Sudan microdata being recovered. This is just an example. This is a, um, a microfilm reel of the Darfur region uh, from Sudan. And you can see this, this did require some, some rescue and this data was recovered. Um, this is Bangladesh. Um, this, while this was stored in a, um, a, a more modern facility, um, the microdata still did require some recovery because these reel-to-reel -reel tapes are not meant to last forever. Um, so this is, Katie and I did not work on this project, but we were certainly, I believe, inspired by it. And uh, lest anyone who works with US data get too comfortable about the state of, um, of our data storage here, uh, I would say, and I, I think about 2005, uh, Steve Ruggles, who we uh, both worked with there, um, asked the US Census Bureau to, uh, if they would consider making available their complete count microdata from the 1960 through 1990 censuses in the research data centers. They had already made the 2000 census data available there, so we all saw like a lot of potential for using um, these full count data sets over time in the same way that we had been in the business of making uh, public use data sets easy to use over time. Um, some of it was recoverable and some of it wasn't. Uh, so the largest piece that was not was from the 1960 census, and we got um, a grant from the National Institutes of Health to go recover it. Um, it is like a lot of our government's valuable data. It is stored in a National Archives cave in Lenexa, Kansas. So that is what this is a picture of, is the um, National Records Center in Kansas, where we uh, did our work on this project. This is the inside of the cave. You can see this is, um, while it is a modern office space, uh, there are plenty of unfinished cave walls. Um, the 1960 census, which is what we were recovering, because uh, just like data in some of the countries I showed you before, it was not recoverable. It was not stored on media that um, it could be digitized. So we had to go back to the original reel-to-reel -reel, um, microfilm uh, that the 1960 census was available on. These are the original manuscripts from the census that were filmed. Um, we digitized the microfilm. We, conduct, we conducted optical mark recognition. Uh, this was a bubble form, sort of just like the SAT, that, that you t um, where uh, it was fairly straightforward to recover. Forms like that are uh, certainly made to be read by computers. And um, this was uh, a successful data rescue project where we uh, created, and this was after I had left Minnesota, so this was more Katie, created um, a new public use microdata sample from the 1960 census and a new internal uh, complete Census Bureau microdata file that is available in the FSRDCs, the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers. Um, okay, so I loved this project. I went to the Census Bureau about halfway through it. Um, Katie went to the Census Bureau not too long after that and has really carried the torch uh, for these types of projects. And I um, have been thrilled to come to ICPSR about three years ago, and we've continued to work together on this. And David Bleckley is uh, now part of the team. So you're going to hear a little bit more from both of them shortly. Um, a lot of this is available, as I've said. So first, I want to tell you what we're doing and what's already been done, because this is a dream that many people have been working on for quite a while. Available large-scale linked census data already. Uh, as some of you may know, census data is, uh, is by law held private for 72 years from the date of collection. What that means is that the 1940 census is publicly available. Everything before it is publicly available. And the 1950 census will become available in uh, 2022. Everything more recent than that is still confidential and um, is available only via the Census Bureau in their secure facilities. So, there's been quite a bit of work linking that publicly available data. Uh, the University of Minnesota uh, has gotten agreement from two genealogical companies to share the complete microdata files that they entered for genealogical purposes 
for 1850 through 1940. Uh, the team there made what's called the IPUMS linked samples. It's already available. This is longitudinal data. Uh, researchers at the National Bureau of Economic Research have taken that same data and made uh, their version of the linked census data from 1850 through 1940. So this is all publicly available longitudinal data, uh, really well documented. Um, and I should say both of these efforts um, are still underway. So there's more, it's all available, but they're improving it. They're trying to get really higher linkage rates by using um, vital records from that period. Um, because the, the linkage rates for censuses in this period are somewhere around 10 to 15 percent. Um, this is largely, this is not because anyone's doing anything wrong in their, in their linkage work. It's because the linkage keys are quite crude. You essentially have name and age and state of birth. And um, if you don't have unique people over time, you really can't very confidently do the linkage. So that's why we're looking at linkage rates of about 10 to 15 percent there. Okay, so that's one huge body of linked data. The other is from 2000, 2010, and the American Community Survey, available in the FSRDCs. So this is restricted data. And for reasons that you're going to hear a little more about, these linkage rates are much higher. They're closer to 90 percent. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Katie and I, along with researcher, a couple of other researchers at University of Minnesota, Duke University, and Northwestern, brought in the full 1940 census microdata, so that public microdata we brought into the Census Bureau and linked it forward to the 2000 census. Uh, this has been a really powerful research product that is now being used by, by lots of teams. It's requestable in any federal statistical research data center. Um, but it's also been a real demonstration of the potential for really linking this whole series from 1850 to the present. So this is the big gap, 1960 through 1990. That is what we are focusing on for the next five years in ways that you're about to hear. Um, it's hard, it's hard. This red area that we're working on does have some unique challenges related to data rescue. Uh, these files don't have names. Every other file you saw there, 1850 to 2020, there are names on the microdata, but for these years, there are not names. They're handwritten by respondents on the original census forms. Those forms are stored on microfilm and um, they're highly restricted because these are still confidential data. Um, so this presents a variety of new challenges in uh, recovering the data and linking it over time. So we're very fortunate to be doing this work at the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is, uh, has some unique capabilities in record linkage. They, uh, it's not just something they happen to be good at, it is core to their DNA. It's essentially coded into Title 13 of the US Code, um, where the Census Bureau is uh, instructed to the maximum extent possible to acquire data from other departments and the federal government, from states, from counties, from cities, um, whenever they can use that information instead of conducting direct inquiries. So they are to acquire data when it can help them reduce respondent burden. If the government already has the data, they're supposed to acquire it and use it rather than asking people questions. Um, and this is what they do. So uh, record linkage is core to this. If you're conducting a survey and you want to add more to it than you're asking, you're going to need to use record linkage to do that. And that is uh, very much what they do. So here's a selection of data that's held at the Census Bureau that the Census Bureau did not produce. So they have acquired this data under the terms that I, I just showed you, and they've linked it. So most of this is linked into a common infrastructure. And furthermore, it's used to facilitate linkage of census data. And um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what I'm saying there, this data from numerous federal agencies uh, is the way by which census data is linked over time. So censuses are linked to this composite of federal agency data um, because there's data available surrounding each census. There's there's federal data around the 2000 census. There's federal data around the 2010 census. That really is um, an excellent resource to facilitate linkage. 
and the Census Bureau's record linkage, um, it's, of course, there's a variety of ways they're doing it, but the main production record linkage there uses pretty standard record linkage variables like name, date of birth, sex, birthplace. Um, and again, standard, you know, very robustly carried out, but standard techniques of data cleaning and probabilistic matching. When they link each census, which they've done, which we've done for 2000, 2010, and 1940, um, to that composite of administrative records, the cases are assigned a protected identification key, which is consistent across files. This is the key that you use to follow an individual over time. And of course, um, before any researcher would see this, all PII is removed and this data, this data with PICs on it is, is only available in secure facilities. As I said, these linkage rates are quite high. Um, in the 2010 census, about 91%. In the 2000 census, pretty close to that. In the 1940 census, it's lower, around 41%. And again, that's for the same reasons that I was describing for that earlier data. The linkage keys just aren't there to establish unique individuals. Um, uh, we do believe we can get this rate up a little bit. Um, it's never, in my view, going to be as high as 2000 and 2010. It's just you can't establish the uniqueness of the individuals. Um, so this linking to an administrative records composite is a really, really powerful tool. And it's why those linkage rates are so high. It certainly has its shortcomings as well. Um, these are the groups that it's easiest to assign keys to, picks to. They're, workers, they're people who appear in administrative records reliably taxpayers, workers, persons on Medicare. The federal government knows quite a bit about these people because they already appear in their participants in federal programs or they pay taxes. Um, so that's great. But there, are, of course, are groups that are much harder to assign picks. Um, residents who don't have a social security number, this is less true than it was when I was there. Uh, well, when I left the Census Bureau in 2017, it was impossible um, to put a linkage key on somebody without a social security number. I do not believe that is true anymore. Uh, mobile populations, transient populations, children not reported on tax forms, linkage rates are lower for all of these groups. And this is how that looks geographically. So this is, um, I'll just kind of give you the broad strokes here. This is a result of an effort by census researchers following the 2010 census, where they attempted to link all records in the 2010 census to the administrative records held in the agency. The purple and blue areas you see up, up here in Michigan and Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, that is where the linkage rates were very high. That is where most of the people in the census had already been observed um, by some federal program. The linkage, when you see orange, yellow, green, much lower coverage. So here's where the decennial census was encountering people who the government had never encountered before, or at least that couldn't be linked successfully with the algorithms that um, the researchers who conducted this work were using. So this, it's not only there's bias in who is linked that you can see in terms of person level characteristics and in terms of geography. So this is something that uh, researchers have to keep in mind and that we as the people making the data have to try to improve upon. And I'm going to hand it over to Katie Genetic now to talk about how we're doing some of this. Not exactly seamless, but almost there. Uh... All right. Thank you, Trent. Um, so Trent covered a lot of this already, but we're going to go into a little more detail about how we actually did the 1940 census and how we're looking forward to some of this other data and how we're working on doing 1990. Um, so as you mentioned, there's complete count data from IPOMS from 1850 to 1940. And this actually all started after 2012 when the 1940 data became public. So you can go look at Ancestry.com or the National Archives and look up your 1940 images. 
Um, and when that became public, um, IPOMS worked hard to get all of this complete count data so we could use it for research. We obtained the census this from them. So the Census Bureau obtained the census from IPOMS. And actually, I was at IPOMS then, and Trent was at the Census Bureau. As you said, we, we overlap at these things, uh, these places, back in 2015. And with the hope, as you said, of linking this 1940 census, as you've seen, into our linkage infrastructure. And right away, when we, we've done both, you know, a lot of this historical linkage, if we directly linked 1940 to 2000, um, we would expect about 2 million links and almost no women. Partly, this is a really long time period, right? A big gap. And um, we'd be linking on names, on age, and on sex. And that would be it. So this direct linkage, like some of this historical linkage, we wouldn't expect it to be that great. But as Trent mentioned, we have something sort of richer than that. We have an administrative records composite. So in the administrative records composite, which is compiled of data from various um, federal agencies and, and the census, but um, in this point, we have IRS data, SSA data, and other data. And we're able to link the 1940 census to that composite using names, date of birth, or date of birth and age, sex, uh, state and county of birth, and really importantly, parents' names. So for people that are living with parents, then we get a ten, like potentially one more name, one more first name and last name, and potentially two. So we're able to use that information because we also have parents' names in the administrative records composite from your SSA record. And with this, we get about 54 million links. So that's the the pics that um, Trent was talking about there, about in 1940, we were able to assign protected identification keys to 54 million people. Um, and this is what they look like. As you can see here, uh, the dark shaded areas on our population pyramid are the numbers that we have links for, and the lighter ones are the ones that we don't. So you can see we have a lot more linkages for those that are younger. Again, they were living with their parents. So for individuals under the age of 20, we actually get closer to 70% of the cases having PICS. And this is big too, because as we link to 2000, right, those that are alive are most likely to be younger than. So now with 2000 linked to the administrative records composite, we have a, almost 250 million links between those two or 250 million of the 2000 cases with PICS. And when we link them together, we get 26 million links. So we would expect, if everyone had possible, um, taking account of death rates and whatnot, about 41 million links. So we are getting overall um, a little over 40% of the population right now in 1940 with a pick on them. Uh, so as Trent said, we're actively working to improve this. One of the big things about this too is that the we obtained this data from IPMS. They obtained that data from Ancestry.com, who had the data hand entered from the 1940 census in other countries. There was actually a second indexing of the 1940 data set done by volunteers um, through the Church of Latter-day Saints and FamilySearch.org. So they have another set of names. Um, we're also actively trying to get those version of the names because it's really essential that our name quality is good in order to link it. Rumor has it that the family search names are better. They also supposedly only match each other 40% of the time perfectly. So um, we're really hopeful that we'll get that information. In addition, we're trying to obtain some additional data to get picks on more of these people from 1940. So 1940 is underway. That data is available. And um, David will talk a little bit more about that too for you to get through the FSRDCs linked to other data. But as Trump mentioned, we have this really big gap between 1960, well, really 1950 to 2000. And this is difficult. They're really difficult to get. So we need to, this is what, what we did, we started doing was trying to see if it was possible. Is it even possible to get this individual information linked in? So why is this hard? Well, the names are handwritten on census forms, but they were never digitized. So the 1960 through 1990 data, they were actually digitized via something called a FOSDIC machine, which was really incredible science. But what it did was read the bubbles to create machine readable data. And now, as Trent mentioned, we have all that data available in the FSRDCs. So we have full count census data to use for research, but we don't have any of the strings from that data. They didn't hand enter names or occupations or things like that. But what they did do was scan microfilm of them. So sort of like in other countries, just like that in the US, we have microfilm data 
from scanned images from the historical censuses. And right now, um, for 1990 alone, that's 130 million or 130,000 microfilm reels stored in our National Processing Center in bins like this. So just like you see here, they're stored there. I actually, I gave this talk recently to some younger people and I had to explain what a micro film reader was. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people on this call have actually used microfilm at some point in their life, <laughs> looking at back in the libraries. Um, but that's basically how you look at this data. The other thing to note is just like in other countries, as Trent mentioned, that this data is at risk of having problems. So we have a copy of it at the Census Bureau, but the National Archives also has a copy of it, right? They're our archival body for the US. And so they have the data on hand on reels as well. Well, for 1950, they actually had vinegar syndrome hit some of their microfilm reels. And if there's any, uh, you know, data librarians on here, it's a really big deal because you have to contain it. It can like catch other, it's like a disease, it's like coronavirus, but for microfilm reels. Um, so they had to, Trent's rolling his eyes at me. It wasn't a very good joke. It was on the fly. Um, but so they had to actually use our copy. We've had to send copies over of a good chunk of the 1950 census. So it's really lucky that we have copies. But there's another piece here where not only do we want to get the names off these, but we would like to digitize all of these images in order to store them in a digital, like a digital way that we think will last longer. So um, that said, this is what it looks like. So we have images of the 1990 census that look like this, pictures of this. These are made up. This is not real data, but we wrote in names here to give you an idea of what it looks like. So you can see here that there are names across the top. And we want to digitize these names, but we also need to link them to the data that we already have. And we need to get that little number off the bottom. Um, so you can see sort of a, a number, which I thought would light up there, but um, off the bottom that we need so that we can link these individuals to their responses in our already digitized data. This task is incredibly hard. So that 1990 data, you had, whoever was living in the household filled it out, and that's the picture we took. As you can see here, compared to the other data that we collect now, for the 2020 census, if you filled out a form and didn't type it in, you wrote it into blocks. Likewise, the American Community Survey, you separated your last name and your first name. However, the 1990 census, you just wrote in anything. It wasn't parsed out like that in a nice way. Um, again, the 1940 census was sort of hand, hand scribbled in, but done, the 1940 census, by one enumerator. So as you can see here for something, we've been using OCR at the Census Bureau for a long time, but we've done that with 2000 on where we really made the forms able to do that. The image quality is nice. We optimize them for OCR. Um, and there's, there is a lot of handwriting variation, but not nearly as much as the 1990 census because a lot of us typed it in. And for 1940, there's hardly any handwriting variation because enumerators went around and filled it in for you. So this is a really, really major challenge. In addition, these forms are not public um, and the handwriting quality is good and the scans are not great either, right? These are pictures of images. So unlike running the forms through our scanners now, they were not done quite as carefully. This is all to say this is a very tough ask and we didn't know if it was possible. I, I almost guarantee you when both Trent and I first heard about this project, we like rolled our eyes. Like we were like, there's no way this OCR is good enough. Anyone that has ever tried to use an over-the-counter OCR package on even typed things on a PDF, you realize very quickly how difficult it is. That said, we decided we could figure it out, give it a try. So we partnered um, with Stanford University and the National Academies to try to see if this was possible. Um, we first started by scanning a set of microfilm, a sample of it via two different scanners, um, both the Meckel and the Eclipse. They both did great. So what these do is scan microfilm into digital images. And then we made ground truth data. So we had all of this data double entered by two people sitting there so that we could see, try to get perfect truth data between the two and see if we could get OCR to capture the same names that the hand data, hand enters did. This is where we did the handwriting recognition. This is a real picture um, so that they have the truth data and then they have the images. And what we did is we put out a call for anyone that was willing and we tried to partner with some different universities to come in and do the OCR for us and see what they were doing. So we were trying to get at the most recent technology. Um, because as we mentioned, these are all stored in Title 13 protected spaces. We had to get these people sworn, like sworn status. They had to become contractors. 
Um, so there were a lot of groups that weren't willing to sort of go this work this hard to get in there, but we had a number that were, um, and one really stood above the rest. So we had one group out of the University of Southern California, and they're sort of known to be the sort of leading edge on data on sort of handwriting recovery. And when we get our preliminary results, looking at this 1990 census handwriting, we got perfect matches um, on first names for 71% of the time and last names 67% of the time. We were really pleased with this because we think from this that we will be able to assign protected identification keys at a decent rate. And part of the reason we're able to do that is because of all of the sort of history that we have of linking these together and using sort of variants on these names. So even if they're not perfect, if they're close to perfect, we can assign identifiers to them. So this was really exciting for us. We feel like we can move forward with that. We're documenting that now. And am I still going, David? Yeah. Uh, this, and how you can get this data is through a federal statistical research data center. So as Trent mentioned, um, we've all been working in the FSRDCs and this data is available to researchers in the RDCs. Not the 1990 data yet, we'll talk about that coming up, but the 1940 data and before and after. So the FSRDC is a secure computing lab um, where you can use restricted data for statistical purpose only. They're around the US. There's also virtual access to them. This is made possible by contractual agreements with universities or other research institutions and the US Census Bureau. So this is a long time running. Um, this is uh, many years ago now, definitely more than, it's actually, you hear varying stories about when this actually started. Um, I've, heard, I've heard rumors it was actually all began over a pint of Guinness in Boston, um, but that the Census Bureau wanted researchers using our data to improve it. And this is how we're able to do that. So we make our data available via contractual arrangements with universities and other agencies. And we direct the FSRDCs, but it's called the Federal Statistical Research Data Center because we make data available from other statistical agencies as well. And we partner with them so people can have access to the data through these secure centers. All of these secure centers are managed by an on-site census employee, our administrator. And with these census project, that administrator is helping, is there to help you, both help you use the data, but also get access to the data. Um, so you write a proposal and they support you with that. They're also there to enforce the rules and to make sure we take a lot of pride at the Census Bureau and keeping your data confidential and anonymous. And all of the work we're talking about here, by the time the researchers get it are completely anonymized. All the linkages from across people and individuals are anonymous You're using anonymous linkage keys. And all of the work we're doing with recovering these data are done in highly secure facilities by a limited amount of staff. Um, because we, we take people's privacy very, very seriously and your confidentiality seriously. Likewise, that's why we have these centers around and where people work at them. So you can see here on the map um, where ISR is located in ICPSR, right up there in Michigan. They have one of the busiest RDCs around. Um, I actually work out of the Colorado RDC. Um, we also have an up and coming busy RDC out here. So we, a lot of work going on. Again, you can also access all of the census data virtually through the RDCs as well. In addition to the census data we're talking about, there's also business data in the RDCs, and this data can be often linked to the business data. Um, we have microdata on US businesses with geolocations, payrolls, foreign investments. We also have all of this data and survey data. So we have the American Community Survey data, CPS data, current population survey data, the SIP data, and most of these can be linked at the individual level to sort of our core census data and back to 1940 potentially. These data also give more information on the POMS. They sometimes have more information on industry and occupation codes, on racial categories. Um, I have a lot of researchers using the data so that they can get non-top coded income and non-body coded income as well. Finally, we also have a lot of different health data available. So we have CMS data, we have enrollment data and Medicare and Medicaid. We have this social security numinant file, which includes birthplace and date of death, um, records for everyone in the country. So there's a lot, which again, can be linked into all of this data. There's a lot of potential data for research here. In order to get access, um, just yesterday, I, no, this week, I was giving a talk um, with the Federal Kid Committee on Statistical Methodology, and there was automatically lots of complaints about getting this data. And I actually think the FSRD system has really improved 
um, both timing and availability and sort of speed of getting this data. So automatically go talk to an RDC administrator because what you will do with them is work on a proposal to the Census Bureau to use this data. These proposals are, they describe what you're going to do because we need to take this data, like what you're gonna say you're gonna do and say, yep, this is valuable and important and it benefits us. Um, but that happens in a pretty streamlined process. So you're gonna write this proposal, you write, you tell us how this is gonna benefit the Census Bureau and then you submit it and you wait for approval. So then we review it at the Census Bureau. And again, your RDC administrator will help you through this. I, I actually, I tell everyone, I think this is a lot more, way more straightforward than doing something like a grant proposal. And you're nearly guaranteed to get access or do a revise and resubmit and get access. It's like a guaranteed publication and you get to get your hands on all of this data. Once this happens, you get something called special sworn status. So this is where we at the Census Bureau make you a contractor. You're basically an unpaid contractor accessing our data. Um, this involves a background check. Uh, you don't need to be a US citizen. You just need to have resided in the US um, legally for three of the last five years. So this is a, just sort of how we say like, yep, we think you're able to come in and use this data. And then you get to go do research in the FSRDC. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to David. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Katie. Let's see if I can get my slides up. Look at that. OK. All right. Hopefully, now you're seeing my presentation slide. All right, great. So this is the ICPSR data fair. And um, we want to give you a quick overview of three existing ICPSR resources that are related um, to the de decennial census dig digitization and linkage project. Um, because as Katie mentioned, the 1990 data aren't going to be available in the FSRDC for a while. So we just want to kind of whet your appetite with some of these uh, these available resources. Um, David, and just those so three... you know, you might want to flip your display. We're seeing your um, presenter notes. Okay. Are you? Perfect. That's better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Lynette. Um, all right. So the, the three things that I wanted to discuss were the U.S. Census Bureau Data Repository, Research Data Gov, and Linkage Library. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau Data Repository preserves and disseminates survey instruments, specifications, data dictionaries, code books, and um, other materials provided by the U.S. Census Bureau. ICPSR also has added additional census-related um, data collections from our larger holdings. And currently there are over 900 records um, in the repository ranging from public use data files to uh, metadata records that were provided by the Census Bureau about their other project products. Um, and so I think it's a really good place to uh, do some data exploration and get a feel for what types of products are out there. Um, and you can definitely um, access data through it, but you could also go back to the Census Bureau and, and see if there are other additional resources related to, um, to the previous resources that were available. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is Research Data Gov, which is a web portal and application system for discovering um, and requesting restricted microdata from the federal statistical agencies. The data aren't uh, available through ICPSR, but ICPSR provides a centralized um, portal for applying and uh, discovering the data. Um, you'll get the data actually through the, the relevant statistical agency. Um, IP, ICPSR developed Research Data Gov with support and guidance from the Census Bureau, the Office of Management and Budget, and the Interagency Council on Statistical Policy. Through Research Data Gov, you can search for and apply to access over 180 um, restricted data sets from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, Bureau of Justice Statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Census Bureau, the National Center for Health Statistics, and the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. So it's a, it's a really cool uh, way to access these uh, restricted data um, all in a centralized place. And you can kind of, um, regardless of what the, the data source is, you can um, find data about the topic that you're interested in. 
And finally, I want to talk about the linkage library. It is a community as well as a repository um, that allows researchers involved in combining data sets, facilitating um, comparison of different algorithms and promoting transparency and replicability of research. Through the linkage library, um, computer scientists, statisticians, and social behavioral, economic, and health scientists can deposit code as well as their data to provide comments on each other's uh, projects and code um, and overall just collaborate on the types of linkage that we've been describing um, here in, in our presentation today. The linkage library allows users to upload their files directly um, to our, uh, our repository, but you can also refer out to a GitHub repo because we realize that users are often um, doing version control and collaborating using um, resources like GitHub, and we don't want you to have to duplicate your efforts. How do you access these resources? Um, in my opinion, the quickest way is to go to the ICPSR webpage, um, which is easily accessed at icpsr.org, and you can scroll all the way, uh, almost to the bottom, where you'll see um, a selection of these um, project logos, and there I've circled in red the Research Data Gov, US Census Bureau Repository, and the Linkage Library logos. Okay, so back to our, our project here. Um, just wanted to recap some of the, the details that we talked about. What are our plans for the future? Um, so remember, names were never entered in the 1990 census um, digitized version. And so they're only available on the original forms. And those forms are stored on over 130,000 reels of microfilm. Though there are two copies of them, one at the Census Bureau office in Jeffersonville, Indiana, and the other at the National Archives. Good news is that everything else, all the other variables were captured digitally. We just need to find a way to, um, to merge them with the names. Um, and we can also use the individual tax records from the 1969 to, or from 1969 to 1989, which the Census Bureau has used to supplement collected data in the past. Those data will provide both new opportunities for us to, to link um, and, and find new key search keys to link on, but they're also provide us new data points for future research. We're in the, po in the process right now of verifying and documenting those data. And finally, we plan to recover and link the 1960 through 1980 decennial censuses uh, using a process similar to uh, the 1990 pilot. Um, okay, I wanna try to rush through this because I wanna leave a lot of time still for questions. Uh, so what's next? We're going to scan all of these microfilms uh, from 1960 through 1990. Um, using the hand, handwriting um, text recognition technology that Katie was describing. Um, we will translate that to machine and human readable um, text. And then we will, using the PII, um, we'll link those data to um, the existing body of digitized data. Um, and finally, create the, the PICs um, to create those um, de-identified um, data sets so that external folks will be able to utilize these through the FSRDCs. Um, and again, as we've mentioned before, once those, um, once those crosswalks are created, we can remove all the PII and that will really decrease the future disclosure risk um, during any analysis. Um, Katie and Trent have uh, published a um, working paper and that's available in the University of Michigan's institutional repository, which is called Deep Blue. Um, you can access the slides after our presentation to get access to this link. Um, and you can also um, just go to Deep Blue and you do a keyword search for, um, for this working paper. Finally, we just wanna really highlight the impact, the potential impact of this new longitudinal research or longitudinal infrastructure, I'm sorry. Um, th this infrastructure is really going to transform the way that social science research is done by linking 170 years of decennial census data to the existing digital Census Bureau data products and an ever-growing body of uh, administrative records. 
researchers are going to be able to analyze social, economic, and behavioral phenomena like never before. And by bringing in their own data sources, researchers' understandings of their own surveys, clinical trials, and previous record analyses um, are going to provide incredible new insights and nuance to the research. We, we just really, we're just scratching the surface of the potential ways that these data are going to be used. And we're really excited for the changes that these will bring to the uh, to social sciences in the future. So with that, we would love to take your questions and uh, switch over to our question box. And we just have a minute or two left. Um but we do want to go ahead and encourage you to put your questions in the box. I know that Katie and David and Trent have been answering some um, throughout the presentation, but if you have more questions, please put them in. And if we don't get to them um, by the end of uh, today's time, we'll make sure that they get answered uh, via email. So um, Trent, one, one question that actually came in through the chat was um, you mentioned that there was a difference between the, uh, going way back to the beginning, um, I see that you answered it directly to, to the person who asked it, but there was a question that folks might wonder about the difference between the IPMs and the um, NBERS uh, or the NBERS uh, linkage data. Could you say a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I, sorry, I meant to answer that to everyone. Um, so NBER took the existing complete count files and linked them using the minimal information that one can link those files. Um, IPMS has done the same linking sample data to the complete 1880 file. What they're in the process of, and they have released a little bit of it already, is uh, linkages that utilize administrative records or vital records from the period, um, which we believe is going to facilitate, you know, much higher um, accuracy and more links. So um, basically, right now they use very similar rec uh, strategies for linking data. Um, it's and uh, you know we expect that that's there's going to be a lot more links soon from IPMS. There's a lot. I mean, the other thing too, just to say on this, is that there's a lot of different ways to link historical data. There's a whole literature on linking it alone, right? So there are every, lots of people do it. You can do it as a researcher. Um, people make a lot of choices in this because it's, it's not an exact science, right? It is a science. Um, again, at the Census Bureau, we're really lucky that we have a lot of extra data. So sort of like talking about having extra vital records, we have a lot of extra administrative data that makes linkage a bit easier. It's still complicated. It's still probabilistic linkage. So in some ways, MBR did it um, one way, and IPMS will probably have slight differences in there is doing it another way. So uh, they both have funding to perform that work. And there's actually additional, you know, um, people out of BYU are also linking the data over time too. So there's just varying, varying different methods to be used and making and doing it. I see there's another question kind of related about uh, name changes particularly for women who marry. And the reason I say it's related is that it's the use of vital records that really allows us to observe uh, women over time when their names are changing, marriage records um, and death records. Uh, so in the historical data, that's sort of coming soon, really being able to observe women um, over time. Uh, for the modern data, we already uh, have a very, very good source of observing name changes from the Social Security Administration. So we, that's why we're so much uh, better at following women over time for the more recent stuff. And going for the more recent things too, and using sort of name changes, we have a lot of that information. Some of it is public going back in time from the Social Security Administration as well. But part of the issue going back in time is that the vital records data is really limited in that it's only available for some states and in some years and it only has certain information and certain times. Um, so it's a lot more spotty. Um, we're really fortunate that SSA has been capturing name changes for quite some time. Thank you for a great session, all three of you. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna have to end it here because we do have another session starting at 1 p.m. Um, augmenting Health Research Through Secondary Data Use, the National Neighborhood Data Archive. 
Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for participating in this data fair. Thank you to the attendees who were here. And we hope to see you at another, another later session.